with such a large population, Majora has quite a big solid waste problem. But it doesn't have the resources, the expertise, or the will to manage this challenge. The, um, at first, the solid waste facility was just piles of trash with no seawall to prevent the ocean washing the trash away. We still have backyard trash piles, which will be flushed out by high tides, as in this event in um, February 2011. The trash washes out to sea, plastic bags, diapers, uh, you name it. Some of this plastic is eaten by turtles. The plastic is lodged in their gut, causing the turtle to die. Um, plastic is also consumed by juvenile albatrosses and other seabirds. This represents a environmental catastrophe. Locally, textiles, diapers, plastic impinges on the coral and smothers it. Both the lagoon and the reef continue to be used as a dump and a sewer. And yet, even in the midst of this awful, messy behavior, Coral can appear quite resilient. So this is a shot from Uligadak, where thousands of aluminum cans are found. And yet, if you turn around, <clears throat> down here at about 10, 20 feet, you'll see lots of apparently healthy coral. Branching, acropora, a little bit of pavona, cactus at the base. Uh, parietes even growing on tires. This is a juvenile Napoleon wrasse. Now this particular coral, indicated by the arrows, is Parides rus, which is a special species. Doesn't get sick, nothing eats it, it seems to be invulnerable to disturbance. And yet, it's very difficult to find on outer islands. Might be restricted to a few passes. Here in Madra Lagoon, it dominates, almost forms single species stands. This is the drop off at the bridge. Very low um, diversity and yet very high coral cover. Back to Uligadok, I had never seen coral disease in the lagoon. Um, but finally in 2009, during a particularly warm year where we saw our most severe coral bleaching, I saw this disease outbreak. This is a diseased, not a bleached, table coral. Since this is within walking distance of my college, I seized this opportunity to take daily photographs of a number of corals. The first one I saw was this little, perhaps it's a Cropera nasuta, fairly common species. And as I watched, I could see that the progression, the spread of this disease was quite erratic and unpredictable. Finally, after killing the right side, it started working on the left side. And after a month or so, one was left with just a few living patches of tissue. By far the most common disease involved this type of coral, Acropora paniculata. Probably the same disease, but it behaves in a different way. And as you watch it from day to day, it seems to be an inexorable spread. And yet at a certain point, the disease simply stopped and the rest of the coral remained alive. Here's another example. Note it's the same species, the same color. Again, spreading from the base, uh, the oldest part of the coral, and spreading outward. 
And that was it. It didn't spread any further. I watched for weeks and weeks, on into October, November, even December, and that's what the disease did. Now compare this to the adjacent coral. It appears to be the same species, different color. Again, the disease starting near the center and spreading consistently but somewhat irregularly. And you'll see these white patches appearing after periods of no apparent disease. And then finally, one last patch is killed, and by December the whole, whole coral is dead. Now I saw this again and again. Almost all of the brown corals died entirely. Now this is a different type of brown coral, different species. You'll notice that the disease spread very rapidly, causing this white area of freshly killed tissue in the center. And so I caught it as it finished off the center and then stopped. So all through September, beginning of October, and then finally, beginning of November, the disease started up again along the bottom edge. I've monitored enough coral to see a obvious and perplexing pattern. Every single violet colony suffered only partial mortality. Between 10 and 50 percent of the colonies survived, and yet most of the brown ones died entirely. Purple you live, brown you die. At the same time, all of these colonies began to die in the center, and the disease spread outward. This is curious because it's exactly the opposite of what I find on the ocean side. By 2009, I had been monitoring a disease outbreak on the ocean shore for about seven years. In 2003, I noticed an abrupt increase in the number of infected colonies, so I began to monitor what was happening. So. This series is the beginning of 2004. You'll see a spreading infection which suddenly stopped. Now that was quite unusual. It stopped for at least a month. But then, uh, to my disappointment, a infection started up again. Notice how it spreads along the edge of the colony. Finally, the disease invades the center and kills the entire colony. This infection involves by far the most common table coral, Acropora cytherea, and you'll see it starting from the edge and then working around like hands of a clock when going clockwise, and then finally sweeping across the middle of the colony, speeding up in the final days and killing the entire colony. This infection spreads roughly two centimeters a day so it can take several months to kill the entire colony. Again and again, the pattern is the same. In some areas, the tables were in such close proximity, overlapping, that in just two years, the infection spread from table to table, killing 75%. I wanted to get a representative um, documentation of this outbreak, so I arbitrarily took a large study area over a hundred meters across, 20 meters wide, and by taking over 100 photographs while snorkeling at the surface and assembling this into photo mosaics, I was able to map the location of each of 700 table corals and show when and where they died. I um, interpolated back to the beginning of 2003, um, reducing the sizes of the colonies to 
accommodate their growth. And I now have, have nine years of data. Here's another representative Cytherea colony showing how disease spread from the end of 2003 to the middle of the following year. So here is this particular colony, number 477, and you can see that it remains as we go into the future. So this is roughly 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, or I believe that was 2010. Now that's rather hard to um, follow, so I've mapped kind of a consensus map of the location of these colonies, which of course varies depending on camera angle, and show both mortality and coral growth for several years. And finally, uh, beginning of 2011, the year 2010, I just had one colony die in this sampled area. This local subtally represents 20 surviving corals and 57 killed by disease. Um, a estimate of the full study site, 181 survivors, including some that had appeared during the study, not some of the original colonies, over 530 killed by disease. This is a um, fisheye view composed of um, about 10 photographs stitched together on Photoshop. And you can see as the coral grows, um, the arrows showing infected colonies. One colony in the middle was damaged by a storm in October 2006. So you get the impression that there's still a lot of coral, but it's actually fewer colonies that have become bigger. And some of these big colonies, as you can see, have recently become infected. So this particular site um, can be compared to the map, which I've warped to show the perspective view. And in this site, in this small subsample, you can see there's 87 dead, particularly the ones near the drop-off, and only 22 left alive. These include some that are now infected and will be dead within a year. At the same location, I happen to see some growth anomalies appear in this circle. So I notice that the very first white spot on this table coral appeared in 2005. By 2007, it had become much larger, and then in subsequent years, 2008, 2009, 2011, more growth anomalies. These white, unpigmented, unpigmented tumors appeared. They begin as very tiny, perhaps a single polyp, and then like a cancer tumor, they grow larger and larger. 